out. The Red Nose Day event at the Clevedon Tennis Club started with a solo effort from 13-year-old Oliver Nash, who took up the challenge to see how many first serves he could deliver in half an hour. That's it. Oliver, who attends the Churchill School, is one of the club's up-and-coming juniors. He has only been playing tennis since June last year, but has already improved his official rating by winning a number of local and regional under-14 tournaments. You keep going, Oliver. Playing better since you had his red nose on it. Yeah. 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 Well done, Oliver. Excellent, well done, my friend. Well done. Oliver raised £170 by serving 111 serves in just under half an hour. The main fundraising event of the afternoon was an American tournament where many of the contestants appeared in fancy costumes. Will be Richard T. Until Greg blows the whistle to start. You start straight away, no warm up. Versus Mike D and Peter C. It's all right, Tim's here in his fancy dress. Oh, that's nice. Okay, is everybody ready? Ready? Nine minutes. So spin up now. Spin up to the side who's going to serve first. Nine minutes. Go. Eighteen players took part in the tournament, with five of those being junior players aged between 10 and 14 years. The rest were adult members or friends and relatives of members. Now's a good time to get a serve in. Yeah, more of them. All right. That's nice. That's nice. That dodgy line for the first time. That was well out. The joint winners of the tournament were Tim Wookie and Mike Dale, and the runner up was Andrew Bassett. The total amount raised for the whole event was £450, a £50 increase on the 211 Red Nose Day tournament. Since 2011, the Curzon has been working closely with eight local schools on an educational start programme funded by the Prince's Foundation for Children and the Arts. The Curzon project, led by Cathy Poole, the Curzon's education officer, involved three visits by eight local schools. Today they will be concentrating on the history of cinema and the history of the Curzon building. Do you know how long ago it was that the Curzon very, very very first opened, let's try you. Was it 100 years ago? It was, it's now 101, so very good. Um, lots of people came here on Saturday to watch Mickey Mouse, I remember. Ah, yes, so um, lots of children used to come. There used to be Saturday morning pictures to watch Mickey Mouse. What were the first films like? Um, black and grey. Black and white, great. Yeah, anything else about them? Yeah. They weren't 3D sometimes. No, they weren't 3D at the beginning. Definitely not. Um, anything else? <coughs> they were 
They were very simple and like, like we're just really video recordings. Very simple, thank you. The children were reminded that early films were silent and the actors needed to be able to convey emotions physically. One of the Curzon's volunteers, Ruth, demonstrated looking really, really upset. Okay, so look out for people being sad and upset. And uh, Ruth, I'd like you to sneeze. Okay, so yeah, okay, you can give her a clap for her. I'm a third year drama student at the University of Bristol so as part of my course we're given the opportunity to do a placement in industry and um, so I had a look at a few places around Bristol and saw what took my interest and I saw the Curzon and then um, had an interview with Cathy and she told me about the school's project and I thought that sounded really interesting as we write a research essay on our placement I thought it'd be quite nice to look into the curriculum and the presence of media and film on the curriculum for schools, so that's how I've ended up here. <laughs> funny. With the help of the recently installed Christie organ, the use of descriptive music was also demonstrated, with the resident Curzon organist Colin Gregory accompanying a 1907 silent movie, The Fatal Sneeze. Upstairs in the mini cinema, the school classes participated in a drama about the Curzon's opening night. So, the Picture House, which was the name of the cinema at the time, so Clevedon's brand new cinema, opened on Saturday, the 20th of April 1912. It was led by Delphine, another of the volunteers who comes from Switzerland. She dressed for the occasion in an authentic 1912 costume, complete with a hat, of course. Uh, I've just graduated from uni in September and I was interested in having work experience and in the UK because I've been living in the UK as a student so I wanted to have a work experience here and this job sounded very varied, cultural with a bit of um, education involvement and I have work experience in education and a kind of alternative thing to very different, very, very new, very exciting. So. Down in the Oak Room, another of the volunteers, Sarah Greer, was encouraging the youngsters to develop stories using silhouette cutouts that were moved around on a light box. And back in the main auditorium, resident projectionist Patrick was demonstrating what thermotropes were. And now, quickly show you a picture of a bird, brain remembering bird, brain remembering cage. It's going to look like the bird in the cage. Well done. And I think this is a rotten one because I. I'd like it if the bird got out. <laughs> yeah, me too. The historical drama in the mini cinema continued with the appearance of the Curzon's original builder, Victor Cox, who had some questions for the children to answer. Why is it so 
popular. Why does everybody want to go? So who's that? Is that you girls over here? Where'd you want to go? It's, it's, it's you and lots of people would like to see me hanging Yeah, it's brand new. That's a really good answer. Yeah, yeah but right. it's a bit of a bonus, isn't it, if they come in and maybe spend some money in the local businesses, maybe buying their sweets for the film and that kind of thing. That's quite good. Great answers. Well, things got a fantastic report there. Yeah, I've done some reading up. Um, Kathy lent me the book that Morris had written, so I've read quite a bit about the history and it's such like a fascinating building and part of the activities we've been doing with the children art, because it's the history visit, is kind of the origins of the cinema and the opening and my role is playing Victor Cox who is one of the leading founders, so I dress up as Victor and ask children a few questions and things, so I've done a bit of background research. I, ha I have quite a, a large experience with children and teenagers and young adults. So it's interesting now to work exclusively, exclusively with children and in England because the curriculum in schools is very different and for me it's really exciting to work in film education because it's absolutely not developed at all in Switzerland and I hope it will give me a lot of new skills for when I get back home because I think it's really brilliant that film education is actually now getting included in the curriculum here and I think that's something that should also influence other countries like Switzerland that still have a very strict old-fashioned curriculum. So if I put the light on... The final visit of the day gave the children the opportunity to look out through the special inspection window at the historic place above the artificial ceiling that hangs over the auditorium. A moment may be to possibly catch sight of the many ghosts who may walk here now. Ghosts of both the entertainers and those who have been entertained here during the past 100 years. Since finally closing last year, Seely's, the Hill Road Bookshop, has had just one chance to shine. It is currently starring as the offices of the Broadchurch Echo over on the ITV network. Ah, Ollie, you're back. Survive Sports Day. Huh? Not only that, coffees. Ah. That's three shots. Right. Now moves are afoot to open a twice weekly indoor market in the store. Organiser Jane Brake explains. Well, this is just the start of clearing the premises to make it habitable and usable and safe for our indoor market. So we've had the whole weekend stripping out and pulling down and clearing out. I mean, some of the initial work was done by the film crew from Broadchurch. Um, they tidied the place up to a certain degree, um, but we've got to just finish that off, make a proper job. Floors, ceilings, walls have all got to be looked at and taken care of. We want to have an indoor food market and the dream really evolved a couple of years ago when Steelers first came on the market um, but at that stage we could not afford the lease um, and so all plans were scuppered but however the, the dream of an indoor food hall has stayed with us and then through circumstance the properties have become available again through the kind generosity of Mr Seeley who's letting us have, having the premises on a peppercorn rent really and um, so the food market is going to be happening initially on two days a week but we hope three or four days a week eventually and we'd like to have maybe a flea market, a collector's fair, uh, the property, the building will also be available for lease in the evenings for classes, workshops, it'll be available for children's parties so it's it's not a bit of fun, it's, you know, the, the rates, for example, are extortionate, so it's, it's got to pay for itself, so it has got to work. It's very much a business, and, um, but we think, without doubt, you know, that, that um, it'll be successful and it'll be something fantastic for the local community, and also it will help secure the future of all the independent shops in the road. Um, it'll hopefully increase footfall and make our, our individual businesses, you know, make the future secure for, for all those as well. Well, actually, we're absolutely delighted because the interest has been beyond all expectations. Um, we've had a fair bit of um, reporting in the local papers, 
and given out our email address um, saying that we're looking for potential market holders to, to rent stands from us and rent stalls from us. And um, the interest has been phenomenal. We've got, you know, butchers and a fishman, and we've got a florist, and we've got plants, and we've got cakes and brownies and um, eggs and jam and chutneys. So we're very excited about it. There's, there's been huge enthusiasm, both from or from the storeholders, potential storeholders. Also, the community support has been amazing. Lots of people volunteering their services. And also huge um, support from the local residents and the other traders that trade in shops in the road. So all round, you know, we're very, very pleased with the response. We intend to open the middle of May. We haven't actually got a concrete date yet because obviously it all depends on uh, workmen finishing in here. But mid-May is realistic for us and uh, you'll be able to find out the exact dates by checking the local newspapers. Um, see this window, we were always having the window, what's happening, what's going on. There'll be a diary or a rolling programme of events that are happening in here, any markets that are going on. And also you can check Cleveland News, that will keep you informed as well. Our special report showing the work that took place in the marine lake earlier in March, we are pleased to have answers to a couple of our observations. Joe Norman, chairman of Marlins, tells us that the reason the mud doesn't return to the lake is that it is very soft mud. It represents two years of silt and instead of coming straight back over the wall it will have been swept away up channel. In future they hope to shift much of the soft silt by washing it out through the sluices, which will cut down on the need for diggers. We also understand that time, tide and lack of funds meant that not all the mud was removed during the week-long clearing session. The remaining mud in the centre of the lake will now slide into the cleared space. Apparently there was also a problem that Due to very damp conditions, the mud stayed very runny and the diggers were not able to get onto the very soft surface in the middle of the lake. The very public face of the Clevedon Lions Club fundraising for charity at various fates and fairs in the town. Running their ever popular bacon butty sandwich stall. And of course, bringing a very special visitor to the streets of the town in the run up to Christmas. The 
club received its official charter as a member of the Lions organisation in February 1968 and one of its founder members, Grey Bloxham, has remained dedicated to the cause ever since. So, on the occasion of his 45th year as a Lion, Alan Harker, the president of the club, asked Grey how it all started. And we got together, uh, 22 of us, and we had an inaugural meeting in January 1968, and uh, we said we would go ahead with, the, um, with forming a Lions club, after we'd uh, discussed what the uh, aims and the objects were. And the objects of being, of course, that is to help other people that were worse off than ourselves and put something back into the community because we were of the uh, very strong opinion that you only get out of life what you put into it. We were very, very raw in our approaches and we understood that to be able to help people, we got to raise funds, so we started fundraising exercises. and. Uh, we did such things as entertainment uh, dances. We had dances at the community centre. And uh, then we decided that when I was working, um, I had some spare trailers. So we commandeered one of these trailers and converted it into a, a small stall, which we call Sid's Calf. And we were the instigators of the car boot sales on the old Quicksave car park. And uh, we, uh, on that trailer, we were selling teas, coffees, soups, and uh, we really got the carbers uh, um, system working. And, uh, and I think it was in about 1970, uh, 75, 76, that um, the uh, Cleveland Carnival, which was run by the pirates in those days, well, the pirates disbanded, and we decided that we'd take over running the carnival. And we'd run the carnival for about 25, 26 years. Our greatest object, and that is to operate uh, the policy of we serve, and this is what our communication is all about. I mean, our Cleveland Club were involved um, some years ago when they, we had the Swiss air disaster from the people uh, from uh, uh, Yatton, when they were, uh, went over to Switzerland, the aircraft crashed, and we provided uh, substantial amounts of support together with the other local Lions Clubs and also with the contributions from Lions Clubs International Foundation. And uh, that was a tremendous help. Likewise, w w when we provided help and assistance to Boscastle when they had the flooding. And any, any disaster that takes place, that we uh, are usually the first on the scene and we don't pass the funding through to any officials. It goes directly to a Lions Club to a minister in that area amongst the people themselves. Coming back to, to conventions and, and more to the, the personal, uh, you know, after all we're talking to you about your time mm -hmm. in life, I've seen pictures of you in fancy dress outfits, so, so what's that sort of form about it? Well, it, it, uh, it, it is, uh, you say, a business session, it starts with a social exercise, the social exercise is generated into a, a fancy dress ball and party type of thing. That's on, on the, the, fr the Friday night before we enter into the uh, realms of uh, the, the formal uh, convention. During 45 years, the one, one item that stands out uh, above everything else, I went to an international convention uh, that was held in Birmingham. And uh, to see the, the whole aspect of violence, how it has affected the uh, 145 countries in the world that are, have met sub, uh, alliance and um, they all congregate uh, the International Convention and to s see sp uh, people from all languages mixed together and uh, without a involving politics we went you see Chinese and Russian and American and Argentinian and goodness knows what from all over the world and from Africa all sitting down at the same table and drinking and what have you and having a chat and having a laugh is this what Lions is all about? Christmas time, uh, we have a trailer which we converted the top part of a chalet roof type of thing with Father Christmas in it. We take that round the town, it's illuminated to attract the children and obviously our fundraising as well. But the essence of the exercise uh, is, is to uh, bring home to the children what Christmas is all about. It's absolutely brilliant. This, this, this make, makes it Christmas. 
to see the kids and it's even got to the stage now where it's not only the kids come out, we, it's the, the parents come out, uh, the um, adolescents come out and even the, the uh, elderly people come out to see Father Christmas and they, they are all extremely generous. <laughs> The Lance Brotsky Youth, um, well being a, a musician myself, I was very interested when they, they first um, uh, notified us they got the Lance Brotsky Youth Band was um, practicing in Cleveland. I mean, they're, they're a wonderful outlet and I would encourage anybody uh, that's uh, got the youngsters that are interested in music to contact the band because they'll get trained and uh, taught and they can expand it. And that can take from a life as a musician, even, even a, just as a hobby, is very worthwhile. I'm of the opinion that is, if you're going to be in anything, you've got to be active, you've got to do, do things. Uh, I'm not the type of person that can sit in, a, uh, in an organisation and, and the, on the, uh, the back seat and not do anything at all. And there's, there's, there's people in the club now. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Gray, for talking um, to It's you. my pleasure. That's and I'm very, 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 very pleased, very, very proud to be alive. Excellent. And I still think it's, it's one of the best organisations in the world. For their first play of the year, Clevedon players have chosen the classic whodunit Death in High Heels, written by Richard Harris. Passing through in which direction, darling? In the direction of a very rich man who'll do anything for me. No, nothing's changed then. Oh, everything changes, and a lot quicker if you make it change. I do believe she means it. Mm. You bet your bottom dollar I mean it. The year is 1937. The place is the back room of a small couturier house just off Regent Street. I know Doon can be a bit of a madam at times, but at least you can talk to her. When she's in the mood. Well, yes, she can be unpredictable, especially lately. Mm. But Gregory would be impossible. Well, she must have something, otherwise he wouldn't have had his little... Uh fling with her. Shh, we're not supposed to know that. Oh, come on, Weenie. Besides, he's tried it on with all of us, hasn't he? He certainly hasn't tried it on with me. You know what I mean, Poppet. Rehearsals are taking place in the club's own rehearsal rooms in the stables adjoining the community centre in Prince's Road. What's that you're doing? Well, it's very quiet this morning, so I thought I'd get this mark off my hat. Let's see, oh, and uh, what's this stuff? Oxalic acid crystals. It's supposed to be very good. Acid? Shouldn't you be wearing gloves or something? No, apparently it's only dangerous if you swallow some. Have you ever thought about killing yourself? Don't say that. Well, we've all got to die sometime and it's having the courage to know when. Courage? Well, I think so. What a horrid conversation to have at this time of day. Yes, I suppose it is. Sing us a song. Which one would you like? How about counting the days? I don't think I know that one. Really? I would have thought that had been your favourite. I couldn't agree more, Mrs Fishbound. I couldn't agree more. What a dreadful woman. Is she buying? Of course she's buying. She's an American. I love Americans. I love, I love Americans. Would you like to try something on, I said. Under no circumstances, she said, do I remove my clothing in public. And madam, I said, if you've got something I've never seen, I will shoot it. <gasps> you didn't say that. No, but I was sorely tempted. Have you ever been to America, Dora? No, but I've got some great chums in Greenwich Village. Uh, which you would prefer, Dora? Greenwich Village or Brighton? Why do you... Brighton? It's our little joke. He didn't seem to think so. 
In order to encourage their audience to pay attention to the proceedings on the stage, the players are offering a bottle of French wine to a member of the audience who, during the interval, can predict the name of the killer and explain their motive. Death in High Heels will be staged at the Prince's Hall on the 4th, 5th and 6th of April, starting at 7.30. Tickets are available from the Community Centre or at Souk in the Triangle. Looking to the future, in June the players plan to stage an adaptation of the popular Laurie Lee book, Cider with Rosie, and they are looking for loads of budding young actors, some to take speaking parts and some to just walk on the stage. Anyone interested in appearing in Cider with Rosie should contact Carol on one of these Clevedon numbers as soon as possible. If you are venturing along Lowest Road Road in the next few days, keep an eye out for a sight of these magnificent horned cattle grazing in the orchard at Dowley's farm. They are English longhorns and they are being managed by farmer Neville Hughes, much to the curiosity of his collie Harley. The English Longhorn is an ancient breed of cattle, originating in Yorkshire as far back as the 1500s. It was the dominant breed of cattle in 18th century Britain, when it was valued as a draught animal as well as for its meat and milk. It is now considered one of our rare breeds, but numbers are increasing with the establishment of small herds for conservation grazing. The meat from the Longhorns is also much sought after and these four cows have come up from a beef herd in Cheddar on maternity leave. They are due to calve within the next 10 days and any female calves born will be kept for breeding. Despite their long and sweeping horns giving them a somewhat intimidating appearance, the cows are docile and quite easy to handle. They are long-lived, make excellent mothers and produce plenty of milk.